we have spent the better part of the, the last half of the year focusing on a series entitled What We Need to Know, Answering Critical Questions of the Faith. We've asked questions like, who is God? Is Jesus the only way? How do I share the gospel? What is repentance? And as we enter into our emphasis on international missions, I want us to look beyond simply the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. In many cases, giving money is something that is pretty low level in terms of our commitment. Now, for some of us, giving money is a high-level ordeal, especially those who don't have any. But for some of us, writing a check is the lowest level of commitment we can make. And so as we really start looking at the, the emphasis for international missions, I want us to take a very practical look at the scriptures and in our lives as we seek to discover just how each of us fits within God's mission. And so today, it's my hope that we will leave this place ready to take the next step in our place fulfilling God's mission together because the question we want to answer is what is my place in God's mission? What is my place in God's mission? And so as we look today in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10, I want us to examine three movements within this account that will lead us to some very practical answers to our question. And you guys just stood, and I normally don't like to make you stand up, sit down, stand up, and sit down. But if we're going to stand at any point in our service, it's going to be when we read the Scriptures together. And so I just invite you to stand with me one more time as we look at Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10 together this morning. And the Word of the Lord says this. He entered Jericho and was passing through. There was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but he was not able because of the crowd since he was a short man. So running ahead, he climbed up a sycamore tree to see Jesus since he was about to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down because today I must stay at your house. So he quickly came down and welcomed him joyfully, and all who saw it began to complain, He's gone to lodge with a sinful man. But Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, I'll give half of my possessions to the poor Lord, and if I have extorted anything from anyone, I'll pay back four times as much. Today, salvation has come to this house, Jesus told him, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. Let's pray. Our Father, as we look to your word today, I pray that you would help us to see what you see. That, Lord, we would find our place in your mission. And that, Father, you would lead us and guide us in this time together. That we would hear your voice. That we would respond to your call. And it's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The story of Zacchaeus is a fairly familiar account uh, that takes place in the Bible. Uh, when I grew up, they taught us all about it in a song. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Uh, when, when I look at this account, I recognize that there is a number of launching off points that there are within this text. You know, you can preach a lot of different things and be faithful to themes that are found within this text. But what I want you to do is something different. For those of you that have your study Bibles, I don't want you to spend all your time reading the notes in the bottom of your study Bible while I'm up here speaking. For those of you who have heard this story before, I don't want you to spend your time drifting off to your favorite sermon that you've ever heard on this passage or dream about the thoughts of what being in the sycamore tree is as you crest over the, the sleepy mountains. Wake up! 
And pay attention. We're going to talk about something in a way that I don't think I've ever really encountered it that I believe are key themes that resonate within this passage. When I look at this passage, I see three primary movements that lead us to an understanding of our place in God's mission. When we look at this passage, the first movement of the text introduces us to a proper prospect. It introduces us to a proper prospect. We enter the city of Jericho with Jesus, and we're introduced to a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And it says he wanted to see Jesus. Now, there's a lot that can be unpacked in the description we have here of Zacchaeus. A chief tax collector, many worked for the Romans. Israel was under Roman rule. And so as far as his friends and neighbors were concerned, one, he probably didn't have any friends, and two, he was a traitor. He had betrayed the nation. He was worse than, than the worst. When they designated the unworthy of their society, they would refer to them as tax collectors, and sinners. There were all of these sinners, murderers, liars, cheaters, thieves, adulterers, pagan idol worshipers. They all fit in the category of sinners. And then there were tax collectors too. Um, you know, this was not the designation you might want to carry in your life. And they were dishonest and they were cheats. What happened is Jewish men would bid on the contract to collect taxes in an area. The guy who could do it the cheapest, that was the guy that got the job. The benefit was you got to charge the Roman tax rate and whatever you could get away with on top of that to recoup your cost, and you had to pocket everything above the Roman tax rate. You know, just like the tax man you've always wanted to meet. And so Zacchaeus is a traitor. A liar, a cheat, and he's incredibly wealthy. Made rich on the back of those hardworking Jews that he was taking the taxes from. It's not enough that he's a lying, dirty cheat, but he's stealing from his own people. I often describe our offering around here as looking like a shakedown some Sundays. Especially when we grab the four biggest guys in the building and use them as the ushers. <laughs> I've looked back there many a time going, military, 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 military. Um, you know, we, we look at that and I'm going, yeah, you know, this is kind of how the Jewish people might have felt some, sometime. The tax collector rode around with his three biggest guys going, it's time to pay taxes and your rate's 35%. Oh, what's that? You ought to object to that. Well, I'm sure that Leon here would be happy to discuss that with you in the back alley with his two friends, Al and Larry. You know, you know it's, it's a powerful image of just what kind of guy this was. But the emphasis on the story is not about him being a tax collector or how wealthy he was because it immediately turns to him wanting to see Jesus. And Zacchaeus wants to see Jesus so bad that he's willing to run ahead of the group and climb up in a sycamore tree so that he can be taller than the people who were obstructing his view. We move into the second movement. We find Zacchaeus in a tree and then we see Jesus walking. And, and as we come to that second movement, the text allows us to see a proper perspective. You see, the crowd is looking at Jesus, but Jesus is looking at Zacchaeus. And in Zacchaeus, Jesus sees a man that wants to see him. A man willing to sacrifice his dignity and his self-respect to climb a tree in order to see him. Because folks, listen, Jewish men didn't climb trees. They didn't run in public. The guy who ran in public was the village idiot. They didn't climb trees. Zacchaeus, for all that he was, was willing to sacrifice all of his self-respect and stature to climb that tree to see Jesus. The crowd sees an old dirty tax collector. Jesus sees a man that wants to see him. 
And then Jesus calls to Zacchaeus and says, I, I'm going to your house. And I'm always amazed at the response of the people. Zacchaeus, the tax collector, and he's rich, and he's sitting in a tree, and they go, I can't believe Jesus is going to hang out with him. That man is a sinner. Their perspective saw a sinner. Jesus saw someone who wanted to see him. A proper perspective. We get through, they get together, and we have a third movement, and we see a proper purpose is revealed. Jesus doesn't simply see Zacchaeus as a sinner. He doesn't simply see him as someone who wanted to see him, but what he really sees him as is someone who needs saving. And he says, I've come to seek and save that which was lost. I'm always amazed at Jesus' singularity of purpose. Everywhere Jesus goes, He's not looking for sinners. Now he finds a lot of them. But that's not what Jesus is looking for. Jesus is looking for people that need saving. And I think that's a very important distinction that we need to grasp. Because I think a lot of times we go out looking for sinners. We go out and, and it's real easy for us to point our finger at all of the sin that surrounds us without coming to grip with the fact that our purpose is to find those that need saving and to take the steps necessary to help bring them to salvation. When we look at Jesus with Zacchaeus, Jesus doesn't call Zacchaeus a sinner. He knows he's a sinner. He calls him a son of Abraham that needs salvation. And guys, I would tell you that's a critical aspect of our purpose. If we're going to have a proper purpose, we're going to see people in need of saving, not just see people as sinners. So where do we fit in? How do we fit in the parameters of this? So it's going to be very pragmatic, and really it is. Because, you know, first and foremost, the most practical thing I can say to you is perhaps today you are a proper prospect. Maybe you're here today because you want to see Jesus. There's all kinds of things we can say about you that we're not going to. But the fact remains, you're here because you want to see Jesus. And you may not even know why. You may have gotten up this morning for the first time in your life and said, I think I need to go to church today. Because you are looking to see Jesus. This morning I want to share with you that if you have come looking for Jesus, Jesus you will find. A Jesus that loves you. A Jesus that has paid the penalty for all of the wrong that you've ever done. A Jesus that has provided a means for you to be brought into right relationship with God. A Jesus who has come to deal with your slavery to sin to bring you to true freedom. If you have come looking for Jesus, today you can find Him. Because He comes offering life to anyone who is willing to surrender themselves and trust Him. But for others of us, perhaps we need to develop a proper perspective. We were a proper prospect, but our perspective is askew. When we look at Zacchaeus, we see a sinner, a tax collector, a man made rich through his wickedness. And what we really ought to be looking at are, is a person in need. Guys, we live in a very difficult time in our country's history. I would say that we live in a time where classism is at its most violent point and probably ever when we look at people who have we want to know why we don't and we tend to pit 
lower classes against upper classes for the purpose of political gain. We live in a time where race relations may be as bad as they've been at any time since the Civil War. And I'll go ahead and tell you right now, um, I get as angry at people in the way they respond to issues of race as I do people in the way they bring up issues of race. I'll just be very honest with you. Uh, people can sit there and say the Black Lives Matter movement is a, it's a blight and it's a problem and it's this. And I would say, you know what, I agree with you. But I would also say that there are some very legitimate issues that they're griping about that we oftentimes don't want to address. And that as believers, we should be on the front lines trying to address those issues, even when it goes against our political party or our personal benefit. And I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be... Do I believe that blue lives matter all day long? I absolutely believe that we should support law enforcement and we should support our military and we should deal with them with righteousness and integrity. But you know what? Just because a guy wears the badge or wears a uniform doesn't mean that he's saved. It doesn't mean that he doesn't have needs and issues and concerns that we ought to be striving to deal with rather than saying they're all bad or they're all good. But we can't do that. That's not our perspective. Our perspective isn't to look at people who are facing racial injustice and go, they just need to stop complaining and they just need to get over it. Those people have legitimate needs that need Christ to resolve that in their lives. And we ought to be looking at those things, not seeing these issues as, well, that guy's just a troublemaker, but rather to see that as someone that needs Jesus. And it's so easy for us to lose the proper perspective to not see those around us as people that need the Savior. As we develop a proper perspective, as we start looking at people around us as people who need Christ, we can then start to identify how God has uniquely enabled us to meet those needs with the gospel. This may come as a shock to you. Y'all are not me. <laughs> Y'all ain't wired like I am. I'm different. <laughs> I'm different. Guess what? Some of you are different too. As a matter of fact, all of you are different. But God has uniquely wired you with an ability to meet needs where you are with the gospel. Sometimes meeting those needs with the gospel really do start with physical action. I watched one lady bring in a whole pile of coats today for the giveaway that the mission team's going to do. And, and you know, and I thought, you know, what an interesting thing because I don't have coats from a closet I cleaned out to be able to give that says, you know what? Jesus loves you and so do we. We care. I had people bring in paper towels to help the family in Hudson. And the fact is that family, they the, the, the grandmother knows Christ, but there are children in that family that don't. And as we share and as we engage, we're saying Jesus loves you and so do we. <clears throat> By meeting a physical need in a unique way that enables Hudson Baptist Church to share the gospel with those people. <clears throat> we look at Bill. Bill will tell you he doesn't go on a missionary visa to the country he goes to. Bill owns a business in that country. He works with people and he employs people and they produce a product that enables him to work and minister and love on people in that community in a way that I never could. I don't have any business acumen. People will tell you that. I'm great working for somebody. I'm not real sure I'm spectacular running a business. It's not the way I'm wired. I'd sit there and give every dollar away if it was up to me. I just, I don't run that way. Guys, God's wired you to do things in a unique way. And as you start to see people the way Jesus sees them in need of salvation, you can start to see how God has wired you to uniquely meet those needs.
But you know, having the proper perspective is great. It's great for you to see the need. It's great for you to see your part in meeting the need. But we also sometimes will have to realign our purpose. Jesus' purpose has to be our purpose. What did Jesus say? He came to seek and save the lost. Guys, that's our purpose. I think that we can get so offline so easily. Yeah, I can have the proper purpose. I know that these people are lost, but I need to do this. I need to get this in order, or I need to take care of this thing, or I need to work on this in my family, or I need to deal with this on this committee at the church, or I need to be involved in this community activity, or I need to take care of this. Let me share something with you. No, you don't. Your purpose and Christ's purpose should be aligned, and that purpose is to seek and save the lost. As long as there is one more lost person in the sphere of influence that you have around your life, your purpose is singular to see that person saved. That's your purpose. Your purpose isn't all these other things. Good things. Fun things. Enjoyable things. Guess what? They come secondary, not primary to your life. We don't get to find another purpose and say, I think I'm going to make this the most important thing because, well, let's be honest, it's easier. Because let's be honest, it is. Or because I enjoy doing it more. Look, there's nothing that works me over harder than when I know God is telling me I need to go talk to my lost neighbor about something. Because I know I will, I'm going to have an uncomfortable conversation at some point where I have to turn the corner to talk about Jesus. I like my neighbor. I like talking to him about Wyoming and taxes and the government and what he's doing in the oil field and all this. I enjoy those conversations. It's hard when I have to turn the corner to go, so have you thought about coming to that men's Bible study that we have on Thursday nights? Because I know what his answer is going to be. But you know what? He's lost. And he's my neighbor. And if he's going to go to hell, it better be over me doing everything I can to keep him from going there. It's that simple. Our purpose must be Jesus' purpose. And then we need to start realizing how we can fulfill that purpose. I believe that sometimes we neglect low-hanging fruit because we just miss our purpose. What's low-hanging fruit? Low-hanging fruit is fruit you don't have to climb a ladder to get. Low-hanging fruit is stuff you can walk under the tree to pick up. Low-hanging fruit is that coworker or that neighbor where you can say, Hey, I'm going to Sunday school Sunday morning. Would you like to come be in my class? Low-hanging fruit is that coworker that you can look at and say, Hey, you know, I know you're dealing with some hard things. Is there any way that I can help you? Low-hanging fruit are those people God has put around us that really are just waiting for you to say something about your Savior. I think we miss a lot of low-hanging fruit because we're just askew of purpose. The bank teller, the cashier at the Walmart, the person that you sit next to at work, the person you carpool with, the guy that works on your engine, these are people that are lost. Let me make that very clear. Nine out of every ten people in Riverton are lost as white geese in snow. Don't tell me you don't know no lost people. All of these folks God has surrounded you with and all you got to say is, hey, I'd sure like for you to come to church with me on Sunday. Low-hanging fruit. Who are the low-hanging fruit in your life? And we start identifying those people and taking intentional steps towards them. But secondly, as we realize our purpose, we have to realize there's also a cost that will have to be paid. Everybody ain't low-hanging fruit. You know? I mean, that's just the truth. Some of y'all, Jesus had to work on 30 years to get you here. Um, some people ain't low-hanging fruit. 
And we have to realize what cost am I going to have to pay to reach this person. For Bill to reach the people God wanted to put in his sphere of influence, he had to leave this country and go to a whole other part of the world to share the gospel with lost people God had put on his heart. I would say that's a high cost to pay. For some of you, it may cost you a friend. It may cost you a relationship. It may cost you a job. It may cost you any number of things. But here's the deal. Your job is not your identity. When you get to stand before God on the great day of judgment, He's not going to ask you, and what did you do for a living? Your purpose is your identity. Are you seeking to save the lost? And as you seek to save the lost, whatever it costs becomes worth it. You know, five years ago in a month, we moved to Wyoming. We pulled into town 61 months ago today. We left behind all of our family, all of our friends, all the good paying job, the tenure my wife had earned in her school district, all of those things to come out here to Riverton, Wyoming because God called us to come. And I got to tell you, I don't regret a minute. I don't regret one dollar we didn't earn. I don't regret one day in the classroom that my wife didn't get. I don't regret one friend that I don't talk to anymore. Do I miss those things sometimes? Sure I do. And I have great relationships with people. I see pictures of my last church and what they're doing. And I look back at those things and say, man, that's awesome. I remember baptizing that guy. I remember doing this. And I remember being a part of it. I remember spending Sunday afternoons at this guy's house watching football. But I don't regret one minute of it. Every dime this cost required was worth being paid to come here to seek and save the lost here. And guys, as we look at our lives, we've got to be willing to identify the cost to be paid and be willing to pay it to accomplish that purpose. Who's the low-hanging fruit in your life? What are the costs that we have to pay? Are they worth it? Now those are very practical questions we have to answer within ourselves. And there's a lot of ways to deal with it. You know, you can give to Lottie Moon. Lottie Moon helps to carry the gospel around the world. At Easter time, we give to Annie Armstrong. Annie Armstrong helps to carry the gospel across North America. We can give to Benny Delmar. That helps to share the gospel across the You can give faithfully to your church financially every month or every week or every day for that matter. Uh, because we contribute to the cooperative program. That helps to carry the gospel and educate pastors all over the world. You can witness to your neighbor. You can pray for a lost person. You can find somebody and intentionally build a relationship with the lost person you know. And to help them come to know the Lord Jesus. Not because we want to have a friendship with them so they'll get saved. But so they'll get saved because they're our friend. Guys, there's an innumerable way for you to take your place in God's mission. Uniquely wired for you. But it starts with recognizing your purpose is to seek and save the lost. And to realign yourself to that purpose. What's your place? Where is God calling you to be? In just a moment, we're going to have our invitation. Maybe you're here and you would say, you know what? I'm a proper <laughs> prospect today. I need to see Jesus. And if that's you, in just a moment, I would invite you to respond here at this time of invitation. As we end the service, I'll address those matters with you that you would know that you know that the Lord Jesus has saved you from sin. You have seen him today. For some of you, Maybe you just need to develop a proper perspective. You just want to come down here and you just want to pray or pray with me, pray at the altar. For God to help realign the way you see things. Maybe for you to lay aside some bitterness and hardship, 
some anger and frustration that you've held towards the sin that surrounds us instead of seeing sinners that need to be saved. And this morning you're saying, you know what, I, I need to see things right. I need to see things from, from Christ's perspective. Maybe this morning you need to you need to start realigning your purpose. And you just want to come and talk to Jesus about helping you see those things that need to be changed so that your purpose and Christ's purpose line up. That you know that your role here is to seek and save and not anything else. Maybe this morning you just want to pray with the Lord Jesus about that. That you want to pray with me or somebody about, about realigning your purpose. But this morning if Christ is speaking to you, you're invited to respond. In just a moment I'm going to lead us in prayer. I'm going to make my way down here to the floor as I pray. Wayne's going to come back to the platform to lead us in the invitation. Here. And at the end of my prayer, as we begin to sing that song, if Christ is speaking to you, and you know you need to respond to Him this morning, all you need to do is step into any one of these eyes. And as you respond, we'll pray together. We'll respond in whatever way is appropriate to Christ's call upon your life. But today, if He's calling, it's your opportunity to find your place. It's your opportunity to take that next step that Christ is calling you towards. It's your opportunity to enjoy what He has prepared for you and for you to do as you respond to Him today.